Hello, and welcome to the HPL Gallery's Artist Talk series. My name is Jennifer, and I am one of the curators for the Visual Arts Exhibitions Program at the Cooper Public Library. And today, I am so thrilled to introduce to you Gabby Wolodarski. Gabby is a painter whose work is not easily categorized. It often extends beyond the canvas into the zone of mural and sculptural work. And it sometimes is hyper real and immensely contemporary. So with that, I'll leave it there and turn it over to Gabby to further introduce herself and to share her work with us. How are you today, Gabby? Thank you for doing this. Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me. <clears throat> I'm thrilled to be here. It's an honor to talk at the library, even if it is virtually. Um, I know that the pandemic has really affected your programming. So I just want to say, like, libraries are so important. They are the technology by which a civilization preserves and accumulates its knowledge and its memory and, you know, go ahead and consider yourself essential because <laughs> it's really, really important even though we are on Zoom right now. Um, I really look forward to coming back in person. Um, that said, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Gabby, uh, I'm a visual artist and I may as well just go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Did that do it? Yep. This is my website. Um, it is, I would say roughly chronological, but the thing about my work is that I have, I feel like I have 18 different bodies of work or maybe 18 gajillion different bodies of work. And I feel like I'm always adding to things. Like this series got started almost a decade ago and I just added to it. Um, so yeah, and I'm a, I'm a painter mostly, which mostly means, you know, rectangles on walls, except that I sometimes don't, <laughs> don't hew to that. So um, sometimes the work is sculptural. Um, let's see if I can make this fit. Yeah, uh, there was this series of birds that I did and sometimes keep returning to. Um, they're obviously not rectangles, um, but they also spin, um, which means that you can't really see the whole painting at the same, like all at once, and it's not still. And I'm pushing against this thing that painting has that's really important, which is that it, it generally is very still and I'm interested in stillness. So by way of being interested in stillness, I decided to uh, take that from the viewer. Like, hey, you can't have it. Oh, here it is. Nope, can't have it. I'm not gonna show you video of this because it doesn't really work as video, but um, these, um, these all spin, these are letters. There's like mostly P's and one F and they all spin at varying speeds. So you never see them all at the same time and they're never quite still. Um, and I think that what I'm getting at with this Pigeon Hood series is something that's, well, it's, it's difficult to, to say what it is, but it is a thinking through of what experience is, what it means to see something and what it is that happens in your brain when you see something and recognize it and how it is that that input gets filed or processed or whether it does or does not have a moment of recognition, you know. Um, I guess roughly you could call that meaning. Um, I'm a figurative painter mostly, but I'm a part-time abstractionist as well. Um, there's a, yeah, that's even harder to talk about. Um, but I think that meaning, um, meaning isn't the same as what, what the intent was or the message is behind the painting. Meaning is what happens when you look at paintings. And so that's partly why I try to experiment with the conditions of looking and do this weird thing sometimes where the paintings aren't rectangles all in walls. They're something else. They're spinning birds or they're cutouts of some sort. Um, so that the conditions of looking, so that the viewer in some ways gets like thrown back into that moment of, oh, okay, it's me here standing looking at a painting or like, what am I looking at? Honestly, if the viewer has the response, what am I looking at? It's like my job is done, you know? <laughs> That's good enough, you know? I don't have super high bars um, or, or, or really I should say that is a high enough mark. Like it's a high enough mark to, to make someone wonder a little bit. 
Um, okay, I'll, I'll move on from this body of work. Um, really what I should do is probably, so there was a, um, a body of work that I called Mingle Monster, the dark side of the room um, that I did in grad school. Um, I hope it's okay to go back to grad school work at this point, but it, it, there was something about the, these paintings that made, that made it, that was like an aha click moment for me. Um, I basically did a portrait from behind in acrylic on cardboard of everyone who came by my studio over the span of two weeks. And then I installed them in the gallery standing around. And there was this, it was tricky um, because um, it actually fooled some people. Like when you walked, this is the gallery entrance and when you look through it, that's Steve Yaros. He was the head custodian of the College of Art, Architecture and Planning. And a lot of people went, what's Steve doing standing around in the gallery at eight o'clock in the morning? Um, but then of course it became apparent like, oh no, these are cutouts. Oh no, these are paintings. Um, and then that dissolved as you walked through the space. And the realization I guess that I had about looking is that we see the sides of things that are facing us and our brain routinely rounds that out into an intelligible real experience, right? There's this connection to the part of our brain that says, this is real. This has the common sense reality about it. Um, and so we're, so seeing is believing in that, in that sense, right? It's believing, seeing is believing. Seeing isn't truth, it's a, it's a leap of faith. It's always a leap of faith to see and to trust what you're seeing. Um, and this is the, from the opening, so it really did become kind of hard to tell at some point who's real and who isn't, right? Um, and it was kind of goofy, you know, people who had posed for me ended up hanging out with their own portraits and stuff, which was pretty sweet, but um, like, like that or whatever. Um, th these two guys, right? Like one's real and one isn't. Anyway, oh, sweet, Andrew. All right, um, maybe I should go to something. So let's go to something a little bit more recent. Um, let me see if I can make that fit. This is a series that's, uh, still open, I'm still working on these. This, this is called, um, this painting is called, uh, Why Does She Save Bits of Paper? And I am, it started out responding to my friend Adrian's object collection, or really more, more than responding to her object collection, I was responding to the way in which she collects objects, which is not, uh, not just possessive, not just, ooh, I like that thing, that thing is interesting, I want to own it, although I'm sure that plays a part. It also feels to me like a, like a radical taking care of. Like when she encounters a thing, what I'm sensing is a willingness to honor it and respect it and to take care of it, to curate it in a way, curating not as selecting, but curating as um, caring for. And I was um, doing a residency in her town and um, ended up responding to, to that feeling of what, what is it even to encounter a thing and pay attention to it. This one's called Placing an Object in a White Room. What does it mean to put something in a gallery context? Does that change it? Does that make it art? Um, Does that imply a neutrality or the other way around? Does it imply that now this thing has more to say than it did before out in the world? This one's called Dancing by the Light of the Internet. These are uh, nine feet wide by seven feet tall. So they're, they're quite large. Um, and yeah. Oh, and so there's this um, thing that I fall back into, or that I say I'm a part-time abstractionist, but really what I'm becoming is more and more figurative. And I think that it happens that way because figuration is so tempting. Maybe it's that I'm a lover of humans ultimately or something, but I, um, or maybe it's just that, I, that I'm weak and whenever I have the inclination to insert something 
uh, figurative, something that's gonna look uh, nifty, I, I can't resist the temptation and I do it. Um, like, oh, it needs a fried egg. Okay, why not? Sure. Let's go for, go with it. It needs a fried egg. Yeah. Oh, look at that gleam. Uh. <laughs> but then I, I, it feels sometimes like, like a necessary thing to put little trompe l'oeil tricky things in there for the viewer. I wonder if I can make that a little bit bigger. So it's, so there are these like pieces of paper taped to the canvas that aren't actually paper, right? They, they're like, it's all paint. Um, and I, I don't know if that means that my painting is about painting. Um, although I guess, of course, it does reference the language of painting in that way. Um, that's not really how I think of it. I'm thinking more of the things and I'm thinking more of uh, what it is to look at something. So yeah. Um, Maybe I'll, um, well, I'm not sure which body of work to talk about next. Uh, maybe, maybe this one, because it is also a recent in the sense of like not finished series. I feel like I will continue to add to the series. It's, it's um, I use the title of this painting, which is Oh White Baby Bama Lamb. But really what they are is they're mother and child paintings. And they're paintings that I, once again, couldn't resist the temptation to begin when I had a baby. Um, and my partner did kind of warn me. He said, don't just become the person who does mommy paintings, you know, or mama, mama paintings, or how would you call it? Uh, maternity paintings? Maternity paintings, <laughs> Wait, as opposed to motherhood paintings. I'm not sure what, what the connotation is, but I know that there's a taboo around it, right? I know that there's a, a kind of, um, I've heard people say how sick they are of the mother of child motif. And I've certainly heard the stories of artists who, um, whose work becomes less visible and less important the closer it becomes to being about motherhood. So I, you know, with that in mind, I still couldn't resist it. I was like, this feels too weird and too psychedelic to have a kid sleep, finally be asleep. It was that moment when the baby quits whatever it is doing screaming or playing and is there's this perfect stillness that would seem to be a nothing but instead it becomes an everything by virtue of the of the sleeping child in the center um so i'm still working on some of these um this one's called azia sleeps that's my friend's kid in the middle there um this one i finished during the pandemic and this one I just finished a few days ago. Um, it's really strange to see it on a screen. Um, so there's a lot that comes into play. I mean, I, I've been accused of being a colorist. Um, that's fine. I feel like with this painting, I took up the challenge to, to do something multicolored and uh, I think failed. I think I failed. Maybe on maybe in in real life on closer inspection, it does seem more colorful than it does on the screen. But um, I feel like you know there's a there's a palette that feels intuitively like the background color of the world that I gravitate to automatically when my hand is moving across the palette, and it's just what comes out. And it's this kind of pinks and blues and purples, and there you have it. You know, I guess I am just the maternity painter. Um, yeah. How are we doing on time? Should I keep going? Should I do one more? Oh, we're at 14 minutes. So yeah, you can keep going. Okay. Um, let's look at uh, maybe this one. These are also paintings, except they're oil paint on barrier tape. And I think that um, what, it, what it is is concrete poetry, really. It's like poetry that inhabits the landscape. And they're all alphabetical lists. Um, in this case, alphabetical lists of cities. I can make this a little bit bigger, I guess. Um, the way that this occupies space or makes you aware of being in the landscape is something that I was playing with. This is an alphabetical list of terms denoting 
place or relating to space in the English language. Um, this is probably the only one that fits that where the entire piece fits in one in one frame. Um, and there's something absurd and a little bit silly about it. But also, it feels correct. I guess that's all I have to say about this body of work is that when I make them, and I'm, I'm still making them, I still make these alphabetical lists, um, it feels completely correct. It feels like the best use of my time. <laughs> And then I get really excited when I see them in the, in the landscape. Oh, here's another one that fits completely. Um, there was a guide to the way that a group of these were installed and that's, that's what that is there in the gallery, but... Um, At some point, I I wanted the the background, the ground of the painting to be more or or do more um, or be more explicit somehow because there it, there's a there's a something that I there's an intuitive feeling that I have when I begin a painting that the background is enough that really all if I can just make the background be what it's about. Or if I can just leave it blank, I mean, I, I'm sure, I wonder if this is part of the same impulse that people have when they make monochrome paintings, which is a thing that, you know, the history of painting keeps coming back to this thing of the monochrome painting. I haven't yet done it. I mean, or at least I haven't yet shown monochromes. I confess I have made them. I haven't, I haven't yet made that part of like the work that I put into the world. But there's this feeling that I have of like, if I could just make the background, the blank nothingness be what it's about, then I will have succeeded. And so I thought, well, if, if it could just be as dark as possible, if it could just be black velvet paintings, you know, which of course they have, black velvet has this kitschy connotation, you know, because it ramps up the contrast so much, it's, it's almost automatically sentimental. But I thought if I make just the brightest and most explosive motif sit on the darkest and most back there background, then maybe I'll be able to say something about, uh, maybe I'll be able to say something about nothingness, <laughs> which seems like a strange thing to, to, to be talking about um, or too philosophical or something. Um, but hey, that's, that's, what it, that's what painting is for me. It's a, it's a thinking through um, that's different from the thinking through that we do when we decide, oh, I don't know um, what, who to vote for or what to do with our, or with our morning. You know, it's a, it's a thinking through of not of truth, but of meaning. Um, so, so I have to, I have to kind of go with it in that way. And then I did a, a floral version somewhere. Someone said, and I, Jennifer, I don't know if you know, if you recognize this quotation, but this thing of there is nothing that is not a flower. Everything, everything is a flower. No. <laughs> it's like a thought exercise, I guess. It's an exercise in thinking, like, can you think of something that is not a flower? Mm -hmm. um, and then there are these, like, little individual lonely guys. And, and it really, I actually don't care if it's sentimental. I don't, I don't care if it is kitschy to say that, like, oh, all life is is one little burst of fireworks and then it's over in the darkness. That's fine. <laughs> if, there's, if that's what the message is, then good enough. But it's hard not to get self-conscious about your work when you, when, you, when you do what I'm doing right now and look back at like, oh, these are my different bodies of work. You know, it's hard not to be self-judgmental about well, does it all add up to just sentimentality, you know, or, or whatever the whatever the crime du jour is in terms of cultural production? I think this is my favorite page on my website. Um, it feels the most free because it's just called more paintings. That's all I'm ever doing. It's just 
more paintings. And even when it's an object, it's still just uh, cranking out more paintings. Seems worthwhile. Um, then this one, this, the title of this one is really straightforward. It's blue tape. And you know, of course it's like, it's all paint, right? There's no real tape, but um, the title of this one is way heavier. It's called Many Deaths. <laughs> <laughs> why I called it that I guess I guess it's from um from that saying that a, a fool dies many deaths or some or no a coward dies sorry a coward dies many deaths um at the same time isn't there the the sort of meditation instruction that if you must think of anything think of the inevitable moment of your own death and you, and you will be free or not I don't know <laughs> little horizon lines in any way is, is a motif that I keep coming back to and this painting was meant to be, um, it started out as a complete abstract painting. And then I had that temptation. Oh, it, it looks like an aquarium or it has this watery feel. It just needs some fish and then it'll be done. So in they went, some fish, some tetras and some black mollies in the corner and, and it was done. Will you bring us in a little bit closer to that sure. one so we can see the fish? Say when. Keep going a little more. Oh, I think it's getting pretty okay. pixelated there. How's that? Yeah. Yeah, there they are. You the little aquarium fish, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this one, um, I guess I'll just scroll through it. Who cares if we can see the whole thing? Um, was also an abstract painting. And then all of a sudden, all these cigarettes made their way in for whatever reason. And I remember standing in the door of my studio one night, looking like look, t casting a glance at it on, before I went home and being kind of horrified. <laughs> like, what have I done? <laughs> what is this about? Why did I, why did I insert all these? But it, not, in, not in a regretful way, not in a, oh, I wish I hadn't put those cigarettes there, but in a, oh, yikes, what? That's weird and dark. This, I think, was the painting that led me to the um, Placing an Object in a White Room series. And there may be something in here about trying to either push against or push towards tattoo flash designs for tattoos, um, which are traditionally presented in this way on a blank background, small images that don't necessarily have any correlation um, between one, you know, one to the other. Um, except that in my paintings that when I'm making them, it feels, it, everything feels about how they relate, how one thing relates to another. How does this green light relate to this, you know, diagram of a light bulb how does that relate to a butterfly you know formal elements guide the composition for me and my hope is that for the viewer that that will that that there will be moments when color and shape and proximity and size have the same weight and the same agency in the viewer's mind as as whatever um narrative seems to be emerging well, how's that? My timer just went off. <laughs> Can I stop there? Do you have any? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I can I can go into my question now if you want. You have a question? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> my <laughs> habit is to always say like, do you have any questions? Any questions? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to just be talking. I thought of a great question. <laughs> okay, so. I am warning, I am going to read it because it's really long, um, unless I can kind of get through it. But um, one of the more not so subtle elements at play in your work is humor. Your almost unidentifiable, unidentifiable narrative is riddled with imagery that generates for me, the viewer, a joyous response. And humor in art is, to a degree, very subversive because it tends to smack up against traditional notions of what art is and how it should function. Even though we consider those rules to have been dismantled, um, they still exist to some degree and tend to resurface. So I suspect that you gravitate towards um, your imagery because it brings you joy as well, um, because it's funny to you. 
and not because of an innate desire to comment on the institution of painting or art. So I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about your symbolism and how something transitions into subject matter for you. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at these paintings while I talk about it because you're right. There is, um, I mean, there is symbolism in the sense that once you put something figurative in a painting, it's going to become a symbol for the viewer, or at least has the potential to become a symbol for the viewer. But symbols are weird things. They're not necessarily straightforward messaging like it's not like it's not like a columbine flower can just be looked up in the in the you know dictionary of symbols and say well columbine stands for this boom done that's the meaning you know that's that's not how symbols work they're kind of like little little openings into potential significant experience or whatever um and so I don't necessarily anticipate whether something or not is going to be funny or not. I mean, to degrees. I think that maybe this guy peeking out from behind the leaf, that was a, that was a straightforward joy moment, sort of. Except that my decision to include little dinosaurs from my kid's pajama print, obviously, um, didn't feel funny at all when I made the choice. It felt almost scary. Like there's something a little bit frightening about deciding on a, on a, I think you called it subject matter, how something transitions into subject matter. There's something almost scary about deciding, yes, I will include barge ships on the surface of the water. That will be what will be in this painting now. Um, like scary, not in a real way, more in a paranoid way. But I do, I do welcome in paranoia because I think that without that little scary aspect, it doesn't become as funny. <laughs> it's like not as funny later. There's a flip flop that happens in humor where the ha ha moment is sometimes a relief from the worry that it was more serious than it is. And I, I, I imagine that comedians must struggle with this, right? Because they're pushing what subject matter they can go into. Um, like, is it, is it even okay to talk about this? But you know you wanna talk about it because there's a funny in there somewhere, right? There's like a shared humanity in there somewhere that, um, that needs out, that wants out. And so um, including, you know, that, that's my cat or that's one of, one of my cats. And what he's wearing here is a, is a clown collar. I mean, it looks like a clown collar, but it, it's actually a bird collar. It works really well for hampering his bird hunting ability. It's, we've, it's like tried and true for him. If, if he loses that collar, if we take it off to wash it, we're going to see a couple dead birds within a matter of a day or two. Whereas it, it alerts, you know, the colors, the bright colors and the reflective edging there, you know, it alerts the birds and he doesn't catch as many. <clears throat> but then there's this funny aspect, like he, he looks like a little clown. And yeah, again, of course, yes, it was a, a happy, like, yes, I will include my cat looking silly, but I will also include my cat because it feels slightly wrong to do so. And there's where that, like, that paranoia comes in. That Like, is this okay to do this? And I think it's okay to ask yourself as a painter, is it okay for me to be doing this? Is it okay for me to be painting this? At any rate, that's, those are the questions that I ask myself all the time in terms of subject matter. And I do nix things, right? I do say, no, that's too heavy or no, that's too outright silly. So maybe what I'm trying to do is to walk this kind of narrow line between serious and funny so that if and when it's serious for the viewer or if and when it's funny, there's a suspension of, of the necessity to see it that way. And it's a free, it's a free response. It's an active that, the, that the, the making of the painting itself would be free, but also that the response that the viewer has is as free as possible. Free to feel whatever you're feeling or free to think about it however you want to think about it or free to just dismiss it. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does, yeah. I'm so glad you wanted to talk about it. 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked it. <laughs> and I'm glad that you find my work funny. I guess I should say, I, I really am glad that you find it funny because again, I, I have these moments where I'm like headed out, the studio, out of the studio door. Um, hopefully I will have remembered to wash my brushes and I'll look back and sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's ugly and sometimes it's dark, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I do want all of those responses to be a valid possible, you know, interpretation or, yeah. I want to welcome it all in. Well, we can wrap if you want. Sure. Yeah. I mean, unless there's something else that you want that, that I zoom through too quickly or. Yeah. yeah. Bring us into this one a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I was not able to resist the temptation to make pa paintings with baby motifs or with babies in them or maternity paintings or however we decided to call them. But one thing that happens when you're around kids and you're not used to being around kids is that you start to notice all the design stuff that's made for kids and you know, like the, the dinosaur thing or these like, the way that we surround children with animals, with images of animals is really striking to me. Um, it's not something I had thought of before becoming a parent. Um, and I do think that the presence of children makes everything both more light and more heavy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I dare say more meaningful. And more terrible, really. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> I'm sorry? Terrifying. Terrible and terrifying, yeah. <laughs> yeah, more terrible than terrifying. Um, so you are an Alabama-based artist, but you're in Oakland right now, correct? Or Berkeley? I, I am in Oakland right now. Uh, sorry, I'm in Berkeley right now for the time being. Um, just as a for a, for the length of the fall through COVID, I think um, my, I have my my sister and I have kids that are the same age, and we wanted them to be together mm -hmm. um, because neither of us can. Um, we have to be. We we're uh, we have immunocompromised family members, and we can't really um, extend our family pod. So it made perfect sense to just join our two nuclear families and at least have the kids have someone their age to hang out with. But I'll be back in Alabama in, in a month and a half, about a month and a half. Um, well, I'll be happy to have you back in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> It'll, I, I miss it, I love Alabama. Yeah. It feels like home now. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd say that. Um, I guess we, I didn't talk about where I am or where I'm from or anything, but I, I was born in Sweden and grew up in uh, various places, including Spain and California. And I never thought I would end up in Alabama, but I'm very happy that I did. Well, I've enjoyed this so much. Um, looking, being able to look at your work. Oh, thanks for bringing us back. That was really <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Um, being able to like look at your work and hear you talk about it was just pure joy for me. So, um, I'm just thrilled that you could make this happen and we had this opportunity to hang out and talk about art together. So. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. It's good okay, to so, see you too. Yeah. So bye everybody. And thanks for um, watching this. Um, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>